So what's life been like for you at the moment as a teacher? You see some of your, um, some people who are working in the same realm, for example, Colm O'Rourke, who's a teacher, talking about opening things up a little bit more. How, how do you feel about just opening up? Like, do you worry that kids will move away from the game, that they'll get sick of it because they'll be away from it for so long? Not particularly, no. I, I worry for their own kind of uh, well-being in terms of getting out in a boat and, and being with friends. You know, a lot of kids are missing out on a good three or four months um, schooling, but development in terms of interacting with other kids, you know, learning how to play games, learning how to win and lose, essentially. Like, and my fear is that it, when it all gets back to some way normal, if, whenever that is, that a lot of them will be kind of introverted in themselves and know how to communicate with other kids and it could take a good long six twelve months to get them back up to that speed uh i'd like to see ga pitches and parks open up all right in terms of ju- just in some shape or form the kids can go there um and be supervised in a, in a safe manner i suppose it can be difficult for ga being a vol- volunteer organization but uh i'd like to see it all right just to get them out in the boat and get them you know, I suppose if the pitches are open, you have some control over them. Whereas if they're not, you can you might start seeing antisocial behaviour in teenagers, which we've seen over the weekend here. In Korea, so uh, something should be opened up right. For your your old teammate Sean Ogalpine was on the Sunday game, and uh, he was being asked about the strike actions. And of course, there was a couple of strikes during the noughties, and he was asked particularly about the one with Gerald McCarthy. And here's a little snippet of what he had to say to Joanne Cantwell. There's certain actions like that would have been, you know, in hindsight, kind of, I mean, um, I can't speak for the other players per se around that time, but I know myself like that I would have said some stuff that time like that maybe in, you know, proper reflection that I was probably best to just keep my mouth shut, you know. Um, so, Tom, just like reflecting on that yourself, what, what are your own thoughts on even hearing Sean Oak say that last night? You know, I suppose, Shane, we haven't haven't spoken or thought about it for a long time and even if you meet up like I'd be with Sean Ogden the freshers and the minors it would, we'd never talk about it as such and I was trying to think about it during the week even before Sean Og was t- speaking about it and it, it's nearly like it's it's blocked away in the back of my head somewhere and it's it's like it was a dark time and you, you don't want to think about it you don't want to talk about it but I, I probably would echo Sean Og's comments in that you know I wasn't front and centre like a couple of the lads were in terms of the the faces of the the strikes if you want to call it but looking back on it like it was a tough time there was probably things said and done and and not done that were shouldn't have been done if you know what I mean and uh, like I remember I, I'm a teacher now but back in back then I was working in town as accountancy and you'd be going into work and Ernest and Young and you'd be walking down the street and you'd be seeing genuine GA people and you'd nearly be crossing the road to avoid them because you didn't want to talk about the strike and you'd be afraid that, one, they were on, on the opposite side and, two, that you know they were on your side and they were telling everything to do and what not to do and it was becoming very draining. Um, and I suppose even subsequent to that then in, in the following years, I probably didn't enjoy playing hurling after that in terms of a car because it was so, the atmosphere was so toxic around the group, not within the group, but you know everything about car hurling at the time was probably toxic and um yeah looking back on it it was probably a time where if if you could go back no i think all sides would kind of take a step back or do something better to to make it work um i'm not saying we were, i'm not saying we were totally right but you know there was elements of what we did were wrong and probably vice versa uh it's it's probably only beginning to wash out now wash out of the system in terms of kids coming through you know Mm. And was part of it that people like Gerald McCarthy, who had been legends of the game, that his name got sullied so much? Or why would it be such a dark time for you to, to look back on? Uh, yeah, you know, it was like, you know, Gerald was obviously one of the best car players there was in his day. Like, you know, and, and before that, Bertie, Mor- Bertie Oak Murphy back in 2002, you know, he had a distinguished career with Cork as well. And, you know, Gerald, you didn't want a, a person like Gerald and a player like Gerald to, with a, such a storied history to be dragged through the mire. And even ourselves, you know, we'd come from winning our Ireland's and, you know, there'll be forever an asterisk next to our name saying that they were involved in strikes. And, um, you know, I suppose it came to a head, I think, at the time when Gerald's father passed away um, and the, his funeral is on. And we actually spoke about it as a group, you know, that obviously you'd like to go and pay your respects on a personal level, everything aside, you know, his father passed away, but at the same time, 
we didn't know if you, if you went into it, like if you went into that situation where emotions for their family would have been so high that something, I'm not saying something would have happened, but you know, someone would have might have said, get out or we don't want you here or something like that. And that's why we, we obviously didn't want that to happen in for them as a family. So it was very tense times and, you know, meetings galore late into night with the Labour Commissioner and meetings as a group, meetings as a kind of leadership group and all that kind of thing. And it just dragged and dragged and dragged. And sure, when when we finally did go back in 2009, then, you know, Kilkenny beat us out the door in Nolan Park and back in and the rest of the season was a whitewash, really. Like, you know, it was, it was, it was a waste of a year, really. Two years, even, you could say. Do you think you all lost something as a as a hurling group in terms of how competitive you could be for a number of years after that because of the fallout? I think so, yeah. Like it, in 2006 when you lost to Kilkenny, um, I know in the background I think George Cunningham from the Bears and Patsy Morrissey had kind of set up a, a management team to in the assumption that they were going to take over from John Allen. Um, and I suppose it, it probably kind of, they were the, the seeds were sown then, you know, when Gerald came in then from the county board and, you know, I don't even know if Gerald wanted to come in at the time or if he had an interest, and it, it probably kicked off from there. And like, I'm not saying we would have went on to win another All Ireland because Kilkenny was such a force at the time, but I think definitely we would have contested another All Ireland final if we'd say conditions were right. We were all working off the same him and, and working towards the same goal. But when that came in and there was tensions, and obviously Gerald wanted to put his own staff on the team as a new manager and you know, it kind of just started to fall away and he kind of probably only came back in 2011, 2012 when Jimmy Barry Murphy took over and there was fresh blood coming in and new legs and that kind of thing, you know. I just want to touch back on you saying that you're an accountant and of course so many businesses are going, well, I mean, so many people are now on the um, on welfare and you wonder about businesses in the future and the government has been talking about businesses proving their viability going forward. Now, you've changed to being a teacher since, but you still do work uh, to some degree as an accountant. Would you be in a position to sort yeah. of comment on, on what position people businesses families are in going forward because there's still so much uncertainty considering the pandemic is ongoing oh very tough like you look at all the different industries in this country and they're hugely reliant on such a good local trade and and you know that's probably branched into international trade you, you see town there debenhams and other a uk farm but the small local shops where you know they, they can't afford to lose out on income coming they probably still have rents to pay they're still trying to keep someone in, in, in work in terms of, you know, okay, they might have people go so they can go on COVID payment, but they, if they get back into business and they want staff to help them get up and running and they mightn't be there. So it's very difficult for people. And it's probably only now since the whole lockdown that you see, yeah, look, I think we should support local more. You know, I, I'm only actually after moving back to Granada about a year, myself and my wife, we were at the house, we were living in town for a while, but it's only now you see, you know, supporting local in terms of local shops, local businesses in the surrounding areas, even even buying things online, you know, buying books online, you try to look out for a, a local Irish retailer that sells books online and give them the business instead of a big a big company like Amazon or something where they'll keep going no matter what. But uh, it's going to be very difficult. My father has a practice and, you know, they have to get Perspex glasses in now up so people don't have to interact. They, they probably have to ensure that they, they probably lock the door instead of clients coming in to talk to them and just talk to them on the phone and, that can be difficult too. And, you know, there'll probably be clients that won't be able to pay any fees as such. Like, so it's very difficult for everybody. And the government are in a tough place too, because obviously they want to support businesses, but they don't have an endless well of money. And if you start printing money, then that makes everything more expensive. So, you know, I'd hate to be in government. And what about um, the outlook as a teacher? I'm not sure. What, what class do you even teach? Second class. In primary so school, I'm in second class in primary school, yeah. So I'm second class in Southern Scotland, Spirit Nave Bishop's Zone. Um, I suppose we're fortunate as such that we're still being paid throughout it all. Um, we interact with the kids by you know putting homework up on on the kind of the school system, and they send in homework via email. Um, but as I said, like the kids themselves, you'd be worried that when they do get back to school, that they're after kind of developing a introverted character where they're dependent on whoever was at home with them, be it a parent or a guardian or their sister, and they're not sure how to interact with a different personality in the class or two or three different personalities, you know, and um, even we'd say I have second class now, they'll be going into third class next year and they, they're probably behind in the curriculum in terms of learnings, you know, different things in maths, English and Irish that they should be after learning by now that they'll have to catch up next year. Um, 
but it'd be very difficult for kids going back to school if this if the social distancing is still in place like uh, trying to tell a seven-year-old you can't go and play with another seven-year-old is a uh, is a tough one you know for them to comprehend and understand 